<laughs> so uh, on my far end here, I have Len Nichols, who is a health economist at George Mason University. Uh, in the center, Craig Garthwaite, who is a health economist at the Kellogg School at Northwestern. And uh, beside me is Stacy Dusetzida, who is a health services researcher at Vanderbilt University. And um, I want to just like read a couple of quotes uh, from politicians about drug pricing. These are both recent quotes. So this is a quote from uh, our president, President Trump. You'll be seeing drug prices falling very substantially in the not too distant future, and it's going to be beautiful. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and here's uh, Bernie, Senator Bernie Sanders, who the. Vermont senator who's running for president, and he's introduced legislation, and he said that his legislation is designed to drastically bring down the cost of prescription drugs. If the pharmaceutical industry will not end its greed, which is literally killing Americans, then we will end it for them. And I just read those quotes uh, because I think that we are in an interesting political moment right now in which there seems to be uh, strange unanimity across the political spectrum, the White House uh, and Congress, that drug prices are too high and that lowering drug prices is an urgent public policy priority. And we see in public opinion polls, in fact, it's sort of a reflection of that, that people will say it's one of their top issues, particularly when they're asked about their top healthcare issues. So I actually want to start with like a really basic baseline question from each of our panelists that I think may help set the stage, which is, are drug prices too high? Stacey, you want to kick us off? Sure. So, um, you know, I, I think it depends on which drug is the, the real truth. So I think the problem is, is that drug prices are pretty uniformly high, uh, and that includes for drugs that have limited benefit and drugs that have a lot of benefit. So I'd say that we are, we are rapidly reaching a point where I don't know if we can be shocked by price points uh, anymore. So every, every new drug gets a higher and higher price point. So yes, drug prices are too high, but I think uh, not for all products. Craig? Uh, I mean, it's tough to ask an economist, is a price too high? Because we don't normally think about things in that way. Um, it's really a question of what you want the price to do. Right? And so normally a price is just how we buy and sell things. We want competitive markets to bid prices down to the marginal cost. In drugs, What's the marginal cost? The cost. <laughs> we went over terms I can't use. Mar <laughs> marginal cost seems fair. To the cost. To the, to, to the co I think it's an educated audience. So, to the cost of production, right? That, that's how you want to think about it. What it actually costs to make the next pill, right? And that's what we want prices to go down to when they're generic. But we also want people to make a pretty big investment to make this drug in the first place. And so we've got to provide this incentive to do that. And the price then serves this sort of trade-off of, of sort of access today to drugs that exist and access to drugs tomorrow in the form of innovation. And so where you think that price should be is where you fall on it, whether you want to have more access to drugs today and less innovation in the future, or more innovation in the future and less access to drugs today. And I don't think there's a, that's a, it's a normative statement, right? Where you, where you fall. And there's no answer I can give you about where you should be on that. It's how you value the different groups. The one thing I'll say is that I tend to think a lot more about innovation in the future because the shadow value of that innovation is so high that when a drug gets invented, we get that drug forever. We get it. The developing world eventually gets it. It goes generic. Whereas the time period of limited access is really we're talking about seven to 12 years. And I don't mean to minimize that, but as you start thinking about the social welfare of those two features, you want to think about how much value is generated and who gets it. All right, Len. So as my younger and smarter colleagues have said, <laughs> this is like a Goldilocks question, right? Is it too big, too small, whatever? And I would say, let me, let me give you one fact and then I'll try to answer the question. Today, we spend about 17% of total health spend on drugs. If you count what gets done in hospitals, what the actuaries give you from CMS only counts the stuff we do uh, over the counter. So 17% of health spend, health spend, let us not forget, is 18% of GDP. Multiply those two numbers together, you get 3% of GDP. That's what we spend on drugs. That's also what we spend on defense. Okay, so just think about that for a minute. That, that's changed quite a bit over the last few years. So are drug prices too high? Probably, but we gotta be really careful about everything Craig just said. There's no question that we need to think about prices as signals. There are signals to future inventors. There are signals to current inventors. There are signals to the whole industry deciding where to put their R&D dollars. We gotta think about that. But we also need to think about the fact 
that a lot of people essentially are being rationed today because they can't afford what they're being asked to spend to keep themselves either healthy or alive. And so we have not found the right balance. We are searching for a balance. We are Americans. We want everything. We want innovation and affordability. And that is a trade-off Craig just described. And we should explore it in more detail. So Craig, I was hoping you could just give us a little schoolhouse rock here <laughs> on um, how does how does a bill become a law? How does a, how does a drug become a drug? What is the process? Because I think yeah, that it, there, it used to be different. And I think a lot of people have a kind of old-fashioned idea of, of how drug development gets financed and who does the various stages of things. So can you just kind of briefly walk through from I have an idea to uh, at the pharmacy? Yeah. And this is without charts and graphs, so it's sort of hard. <laughs> but, um, okay. It forces so, you to be yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um so I'm going to be clear, I'm not, what I'm not going to talk about is sort of how someone gets through the FDA, which is like a whole regulatory issue that I think would be better for a whole panel. The basic idea is sort of, do, do drugs restart inside of what you probably think of as a big pharma firm, like a Merck or a Pfizer, or do they start somewhere else? Historically, Merck had a general phrase of, if it's not made here, it's not Merck. And what they meant by that is that it starts at our, with our bench scientists and goes all the way up through Merck to the market. Turns out that the world has gotten a lot more complicated and making new drugs is just a much harder process. And so over time, really over the past 15 years, pharma has devolved the R&D process to small biotech firms. So most of the drugs that we think of today, not about 50%, started a small biotech firm. It sort of gets to a point with a proof of concept and then the big firms come in and they buy it up and then they bring it through the FDA and take it to market. So really what who, big And who finances those small firms? Uh, one, one second. <laughs> so what big pharma is good at is the FDA and getting products to market. They're not so good at this early stage development. Early stage development then is initially financed by venture capital. Venture capital wants one thing, they want money, just to be clear, that's what they have. And if pharma returns are high, they will invest in pharma returns. If pharma returns go down, they'll invest in social media or some other like useless app that <laughs> one of my MBA students will create, right? Like that'll be, like that, that's what the trade-off is gonna be that, that we see there for venture capital. And what that means is that actually in some ways this innovation access trade-off is more acute today than it's ever been. Because historically Merck would have kept pouring money into pharma. Even if I told them they should, even if I said, listen, you should put that in T-bills, it's a waste of money, they still would have spent it. That's not what venture capital do. Venture capital money goes to where the return is. And so in that sense, it's a very different world of drug development today than we've ever had. So there are a number of proposals out there right now to try to take a whack at drug prices, you know, both from Democrats and Republicans, and I'm just gonna list a few of them. Uh, one is that there are, are efforts among many Democrats to try to allow Medicare to negotiate directly with drug manufacturers for uh, retail prescriptions that uh, Medicare beneficiaries get. There are a number of regulatory changes that the Trump administration is trying to do to uh, try to lower the price of drugs that doctors give to Medicare patients. And one of the ideas they have is to just basically steal the price from other countries that pay less and just import it here so that we don't have to have a process for deciding our own price. Um, and there also are you know, some more radical ideas. Obviously, uh, Senator Sanders has uh, a Medicare for All bill, and there have been some discussions uh, of ideas that would like take patents away from drugs if the drugs were too expensive. So saying to the pharmaceutical companies, like, you can operate and own the intellectual property rights to this drug, but if we think that you're being unreasonable, then uh, we'll pull that away and we'll just uh, give it to some other manufacturer. And so I'm just curious, as you think about these spectrum of things, I don't want to get too into the weeds, but how do you think about different approaches and their effect on this pipeline, on the investment in the future? Is, you know, which is, which is better, which is worse, what are the trade-offs? Is taking away intellectual property a good lever? Is just putting a price cap on something a good lever? Or do we have to think about these kind of like super complicated, nuanced regulatory things? So there are always going to be trade-offs for, for all of the ones you just mentioned. I think the ones that threaten to take away intellectual property and patents are very high risk for uh, getting innovation or keeping innovation going because it sends a signal that you've now added a huge amount of additional risk to the whole drug development setting. Um, I think you know other proposals like Medicare negotiating for drug prices they sound so good to the public. You know, it's like, oh yeah, let's just pool our, uh, re like our members and negotiate. But in fact, we, we have negotiation happening in those uh, plans and for those members right now. The problem is, is that we have all these rules about negotiation and what 
you know, what we have to cover on the benefits. So you'll hear um, sometimes when policymakers are talking, they'll mention protected classes. These are usually very expensive drugs that have to be covered by all Medicare Part D plans. What that basically means, I try to give people this analogy, is like if you were gonna go buy a car and it was pre-Uber, pre-Lyft, and they're like, somebody dropped you off at the car dealership, and they know you only can get away from there if you buy a car. <laughs> you have like no recourse. You, you're not gonna get a great deal. And in effect, that's what we've done on these benefits. So we'd have to get more serious about allowing plans to walk away, but that also contains risk. We want access to these drugs. So you know, I think it, it's always a trade-off. Do you guys have a, you know, favorite approaches or, or approaches that scare you the most? Um, I have one of each probably. <laughs> um, I think taking away intellectual property is a very dangerous road that the United States government doesn't want to go down. You don't walk back from that. It's a world of, like, it's a world of what economists refer to as an implicit contract. Right? We trust the government is going to live up to its word. I think the Trump administration walking back on risk quarters was an example of the government breaking that implicit contract, and now we don't trust the government as much, and so we've got to pay extra to be sort of a counterparty to the government. So something along those lines I have a real problem with. I would favor things that introduce more competition to the market. Right? That, that, that's where I think would be good. And if we had to start somewhere, I think we would start with the drugs that you get administered in the physician's office, which is referred to as part B, like boy drugs. These are where the doctor um, prescribes or gives you the product. So like and, a chemotherapy or maybe even a saline Yeah, in a chemotherapy would be, let's focus all our attention, because this is like the primary way that oncologists make money these days, is on the margin they get on these drugs. We basically have turned the United States government into a price taker. Right? We, we will just pay 6% on whatever price comes out of the private market. Len and I were talking earlier, and he said this might be too far, but I think it's literally the worst possible way to buy drugs that the United States government has. We pay higher prices in the private market, we pay higher prices in the public market, and we shift the market to more expensive drugs because doctors are able to earn more money on it. So at every single stage, we are giving the wrong signal to the market. And so we need to introduce competition there. We could roll it into Part D, but that's going to cause sort of cost-sharing problems. Yeah. Or we could just empower, and this is like part of the Trump administration's proposal, empower some vendors to actually do some negotiation. But that negotiation is going to involve walking away. Yeah. And the, there's no secret to low drug prices in negotiation. You don't have to come to Kellogg and take our negotiations class. If you won't walk away from a product, you are going to get a crappy price. And the United States citizens will not allow a government or insurers to walk away at this point. Right, that's fundamentally where we are. Those protected classes exist because we don't want to tell cancer patients that you can't get that drug because it costs too much money. If you won't say that, you're going to spend too much on drugs. So I would concur that the most risky proposal you mentioned is, is taking away intellectual property. No, don't do that. Okay. But uh, plan B, look at the commonality between <laughs> Medicare negotiation and IPI, the International Price Index, where we're going to tie our Part B prices to some weighted average of some nice European countries that we like on some days. And so that <laughs> formula, the formula, and, and Stacy said it, that formula has the sort of um, appeal of removing the hard decisions from our little table and putting them in Europe. The problem with the proposal is that pharma will know they're going to do that, and it's probably not going to work in the long run. So what I would say, look, let's look at what's in common between Medicare negotiation and that. They both are about trying to find a way to find what I would call a reference price, some kind of anchor in which you can pick this place on continuum where you're going to be. And I'm pretty sure most of us would line up in a different place along that continuum, and that's why God made elections. But I'll just say, <laughs> if, we, if we don't we ever, one. if we don't, well, a couple of, a couple <laughs> of but if we don't ever pick a place on that continuum and start the game of trying to be rational about what we're actually willing to pay, we're never going to get this problem under control. And so I, I fundamentally believe that's the most important thing. Let's pick a price. Maybe the Germans are better at it than we are. The British are probably not the best, I would suggest. But some kind of price where I would submit, what you want to look at is cost per value add. You can define that lots of ways. We can talk about that in lots of ways. But if you don't do that, you don't really have a beginning of a conversation. I would ask a corollary be attached to, to Gar's proposal, and that is, look, yes, we have to be able to say no, but you don't have to say no, no way. You have to say, I will pay this. I will not pay more than that. You have to be willing to walk yeah. at that price. 
But you don't have to say, we're not going to pay. You have to say, this is what we will pay. And then the court of public opinion might be able to decide. That's right. I would note, we, you know, a guy gave us elections. Adam Smith gave us markets. And markets can do this if you give them the freedom to do it. If you have multiple insurers competing on four customers on the formulary, and you can walk away, that price will emerge. The price, I mean, it's not like we just pay anything for drugs today. There are negotiations between, current, or between PBMs and manufacturers. You might not like all PBMs, but in rank order, if you look, in general, the drugs that are more effective get more money. We're arguing on the delta of how much it should change. But we, need, we have markets, and if we let them work, and then they fail, then we can go to your... Well, wait, wait, wait. Let's, 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 let's distinguish between dogs and boys. Part D for dogs, yep. right? Part D well, yeah, yeah, is what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That so I wasn't sure who I was going to be in dogs and boys. <laughs> so part D, these are the drugs you get at the pharmacy. These are like the yeah, drugs yeah. that most of us think about when we think about prescription And that's products. where we've tied plans' hands by having these yeah. restricted classes. And if you, let, if you turn them loose, that'll yeah. work better. Part B is the blank check. Part B is where we have no negotiation at all. And that's really where they could be value added in the short run. Yeah. So the, I feel like the international reference price sort of brings this up, and I, but I also feel like this is something that we hear all the time. Is like, why does every other country in the world manage to pay so much less than the United States, and yet, you know, all these drugs still get developed for the rest of the world too? Why does the U.S. have to bear the burden of these high prices? Well, I think in some ways we subsidize um, the price elsewhere, but I think it's because they legitimately do those trade-offs, and they will walk away from a product. So. The company may look at it and say, well, we'd rather get some money than no money, so we'll still take the price. But there are some recent examples of drugs that are very high priced where that hasn't been working for other countries. So I think we have some newer examples, um, cystic fibrosis treatments, for example. There have been a lot of uh, failed negotiations in other countries where they can't come to terms on a price. Um, but really, so that means that those kids don't get that drug. Exactly. Yep. Those kids aren't getting the drug. But here, you know, it's really interesting. The, those drugs um, are, are priced incredibly high. So the question is... How, how, like, what's the ballpark for that kind of drug? 200,000? Oh, no, more than that. <laughs> Two-thirds? Uh, Kaleidico is three. Three. Or Combi is less because it's less effective than the smaller patient or the bigger patient population. But. Yeah. So you end up with these, with these treatments that have uh, very high price tags. And in that case, they're going to be continued to be used for years and years um, as, as the kids are able to stay alive. But you know, then you end up looking at, uh, I was on a panel with someone who had, um, was, he was a pastor, he had two young kids with cystic fibrosis, and he was actually in charge of the health insurance benefits for the people who worked in uh, his congregation. Wow. And um, you know, his kids' health care costs were making it so that they couldn't actually afford premiums for anybody who he was, you know, his business was trying to employ. So it was interesting seeing this trade-off of, you know, really wanting these treatments and also recognizing that it was having a direct impact on everyone else who is in that risk pool. I want to talk about one other part of this is I think when a lot of people, like when we see people in the polls say drug prices are too high, I think they're not really talking about the prices that we're talking about now. These are the prices that like the government or your health insurer or you know, some other <laughs> large entity is paying. But I think when most people say that drug prices are too high, they're talking about what they have to pay when they go to the pharmacy or when they get a bill from their chemotherapy. Um, is, is, is part of why people have that perception about not just the price of drugs, but also the way insurance is designed? Is that, should that be part of this policy conversation too? It depends a bit on your goal, right? And that's a sort of cop-out answer for an economist, but like, if your goal is to lower drug spending, the 3% the that we spend on it, then you probably want, I mean, you don't want to cut cost sharing because people will spend more and they'll use more drugs. If your goal is to decrease what people are spending at the register, which has lots of negative impacts on adherence and other things, then you want to think about that. What is clear is that the way insurance has evolved in the United States, customers are far less protected against the price of, of drugs than they are about any other medical service. I think it's one reason why I spent about half my life studying drugs and half studying hospitals. And I spend all of my time talking effectively about drug pricing. No one talks about hospital pricing. Hospitals are just as rapacious as pharmaceutical companies, right? It's not like they're giving money away. Uh, when we think they're doing, you know, we can talk about that later, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> right, but, but hospitals Major are really high prices, <laughs> but, but patients really, I mean, like, I think I've seen before, like you're exposed like on average, like a quarter of your drug spending and 4% of your inpatient hospital spending. And so you focus on that. 
We expose people to too much cost sharing for drugs. And what I mean by that is that we're no longer just trying to control utilization, right? A $200 copayment on a drug like insulin is not, there's no moral hazard there. Economists are always worried people are gonna take too many drugs if they're cheap. That's not true for insulin. No one's over consuming that. So what we're left with, well, then we're trying to use the money to switch you across products so we can negotiate. All right, fine. But at $200, we're probably well past the point where you're switching products. So all we're doing is trying to bring premiums down then by making the cost more expensive for people who are sick so that premiums go down for everybody else. And that's a choice we can choose to make. It's not one that I think is a good choice because I think we're better off with well-functioning insurance. But that's sort of where we are. That's why that insurance is designed that way. And then we just get this weird arms race, right, where you, know, you get a 20% coinsurance on the drug, so the manufacturer gives you a coupon that pays for the 20% coinsurance. So now we effectively unwind all cost sharing. It just it creates a mess of a system. And so if there is a role for government here, coming in and putting some limits on what you can be exposed to in cost sharing for drugs might help solve the sort of negative equilibrium that we're in. Sorry about the equilibrium. I would also <laughs> point out, Margot, if I could, that I, I think one of the reasons that the polling has sort of taken off on this question has to do with the rise of high deductible policies out there, all of which have to do with everything Craig just said. They're trying to shift dollars to people who are sick and, and keep the premium low because they want to have low premiums. They're trying to compete in a competitive market too. But that high deductible reality means people are seeing the price for the first time. And it, it is frankly shocking. And, and Craig's right. We probably have too much coinsurance in terms of actual economic effect that's useful, and so we're just pissing people off. And, but that's why it's bipartisan and why there's something will probably happen. So I want to actually turn the conversation on its head a little bit now and ask, so we've talked about, okay, the drugs that have gotten into market, they're maybe expensive, what can we do about that? But I'm also curious, like, does our set of incentives that exist today, are we getting the drugs that we want and need? Is, is the system now functioning in a way that helps us solve the health problems that we have in this country or in the world? Yeah. So I, I think that um, you know Craig did a nice job of outlining how we're getting drug development done these days, and a lot of it is based on venture capital. I think one of the uh, most interesting comments I heard at um, the ASCO meeting, so it's an like oncology meeting, was a venture capitalist, and he was talking about how they think about drug development. And he said, you know, money doesn't care about public health. And I thought it was really interesting. And then he went on to explain that they had over 1,400 trials that were starting for a particular type of cancer treatment. And, you know, it sort of starts to pose the question that, you know, if money isn't really distinguishing to try to help us get things that are good for the greater good, or going after targets that have less development, then you have a real problem on your hands and a real problem coming. So yeah, I think we probably will have to think about ways to create uh, maybe more stability in creating drugs in alternative ways, like not-for-profit pharmaceutical companies, investing so that um, we, we could have you know, more stability even in government funded research so that people could keep moving forward rather than spending all their time seeking out funds. I, I, so I, I don't know what, what the we and the want is of the question. Are we getting the drugs we want? We're getting the drugs society's willing to pay for. That full stop, that's what we're getting. So what do we get? We get a lot of oncology because oncology is a protected class we talked about earlier, and it's an easy negotiation, so 40% of venture funds are now going to oncology. What do we not get? We Sorry, don't... Oncology is cancer. Oh, come on, that one they know. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 just checking. Like, like, now, what's, I'm just teasing, now I'm just teasing. Like, like, it's a neoplasm. <laughs> no, uh, um, That's getting worse. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, do we, what do we not get? We, we don't get cures for malaria, because very few people in the United States have malaria. Where's the sort of middle ground there? I think we're gonna have VC funds start to think differently about drugs that over-index to the Medicaid population, right? Anyone who's watched what happened with Medicaid and Sovaldi and what happened to Gilead, and we can have different views on what happened about Gilead as okay, a company. Okay, so time out, so Sovaldi. Okay, I, I just went on, yeah, this is the, the cure for hepatitis C, which is, we have 3.2 million Americans with hepatitis C. It's disproportionate in the poor and the prison population. Bunch of, a bunch of Medicaid sta or state Medicaid And this programs. was the drug that came out. It was like a real breakthrough drug. It cured this disease. The treatments yeah. that existed before were terrible and not very effective. And but just the was, same price. But it was $84,000 list at the first round. Correct, and which was roughly the same price as the drug that didn't work. So, you know. 
yeah. society kind of to win, I would think. The problem, with, well, the problem with the cure for hepatitis C is that it worked, so people wanted to take it. And then we had to start paying for it. And the Medicaid systems ran out of money, so they stopped giving it to poor people. And then Louisiana threatened to take the patents from Gilead using their merchant rights. And now you start to realize that if you develop drugs for poor people in the United States, you're gonna be arguing with the Medicaid system. So it's gonna get the lowest price in the system by statute, and it's gonna have a ton of social ramifications that come along with it, talking about merchant rights and other things. If I was a VC company, a rich cancer patient looks like a much more attractive alternative right now than a poor Medicaid patient. And that's, a, that's something we created by our willingness to pay for the drugs. So I agree that we're getting what we're willing to pay, but uh, pay for. But I would also suggest we haven't considered the full implications of how we're paying. And we, we just agreed part B in the cancer thing is a tremendously juicy target. And God bless them and, you know, I wish them well. But I'm just saying, at the end of the day, we got to think about the fact that is a blank check that we are offering to pay for anybody who comes up with a drug in that space that can get through the FDA. And that is the distortion that I worry about in having no any kind of restriction on what the prices would ultimately be. So that's why I think we can redirect this thing a little bit, tilt it this way, and get R&D flowing in a different direction that might actually be more impactful. I'm not smart enough to know where R&D <laughs> should go. You know, apparently, a, a big pharma has decided they're gonna let venture capital decide for all kinds of technical and technical reasons. Maybe they make sense. But I don't think venture capital is going to get us to where we want to be. But I also, I also worry that, just so we're clear, I think there's an instinct, and there was some hand clapping about nonprofit pharmaceutical companies, that they're somehow going to solve this problem, or the government directing this money is going to solve this problem. Let's be clear. If big pharma, who ultimately gets to keep the money they make, and so they have lots of incentives to want to make good, smart decisions, if they've decided this is too hard of a problem for them to centrally allocate, the idea that an NIH review panel is going to do better is laughable. Right? I do not think that's gonna happen. Where the NIH is really gonna be useful is in two places, basic science. Basic science is hard to appropriate because it, you've just increased our body of knowledge. You can't appropriate it, you can't get a return on it, so there's a public good problem. No one will invest money in it because everyone gets the benefit. NIH is great for that. And it's great for things where we think there's not enough willingness to pay because people are poor. Right, that's where the government can step in, and they might not be able to be as efficient as pharma, but we'll at least get drugs for poor people then. So are, are there ways that you, I'm sorry, let me stop for one second. First of all, we're getting close to question time, and I forgot to prepare you for question time, but I am really <laughs> counting on all of you to have very <laughs> smart questions. So I'm gonna ask one more, and while I do it, don't pay attention to me, pay attention to formulating <laughs> really good questions. Um, so I, I guess I'm curious about NIH particularly. I mean, this is obviously a place where the government has invested a lot of money, where a lot of uh, early stage science that has helped with drug development has come, and where it seems like there is an ongoing commitment to try to like keep bumping up that investment every time Congress has a chance. Um, are there ways that NIH could do a better job of, of helping, you know, as you say, to either do the basic science that someone's not gonna do, or are there ways we should be directing them to get more advanced in science in diseases where we think there's not as much of a profit motive? Should we be talking about that as part of our uh, drug development dilemma? Sure. Uh, I, mean, I think we should. I think that there's two things I think about the NIH. One is that when we're getting to actually a dangerous other side of this, where people using NIH dollars or using, the, using research funding from NIH dollars now I have to start worrying about where the NIH is going to come and take back profits later, because there's, there's a movement to do that. And so that means that at the margin now, if you see the NIH does basic science and you think you can replicate it yourself and then not touch the NIH, you're going to make that investment. And that's just wasted money. Right? We've already proven it, but now you don't have to rely on the NIH patent as much. Um, and so I, every, when we, we used to say if you use NIH money or the NIH dollars, like, you, had to, you couldn't commercialize it as effectively. We got rid of that, all of a sudden we got a lot more use of that, of that technology. We should want every single drug that comes to market to be based on NIH basic science. We should want, we've made a public good investment as a country to basic science. We should want as many people to use it as possible. And then the NIH can go and do things for drugs that maybe no one wants to use the science because you can't get the money later. Yeah, and I think stability and funding for uh, new investigators and also existing investigators on the academic side is really important. Um, I spent several years working in a school of pharmacy, and it's expensive to run these large labs, so we're doing a lot of drug development. 
And if they spend you know, a majority of their time trying to just seek funds and write new grants, it takes away from the time that they're working on actual problems. So I think that ha making sure that that investment stays strong so that we don't start to see you know, labs closing and then new ones picking up, it's, that's a waste of everybody's money and energy. You know, I happened to meet a young scholar here my first day, and she's a new bioengineering PhD headed toward Carnegie Mellon. She's sitting out there. There's Liz. She's <laughs> embarrassed I'm doing this, but I'll just say <laughs> she told me about the pipeline in the world of science people who are finding there aren't enough jobs, even though we all told them to go STEM, 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 and they did it. And there are not enough jobs because Big Pharma has turned away from our and farmed it out to the, to the venture capitalists. So I would say somebody's got to pay attention to that very talented pipeline and make sure we utilize them efficiently. And I don't know what the best mix of NIH versus private is, but somebody's got to think about that. All right, guys, it's your turn. Um, I think there is someone with a microphone. Yes. So okay. we're going to need a microphone. How about this gentleman here in the aisle? And uh, if you could just say who you are briefly. Sure, uh, Carl Schmidt with the AIDS Institute. Great panel. Thanks for focusing on how much the patients pay, the co-pays. One thing you didn't focus on is the role of rebates and the PBMs. And you know, a lot of the cost for um, you know drugs goes to for rebates. So, what's your solution there? So, um, rebates, I think, are. I don't think people would care about rebates if our cost sharing were arranged in a different way. So. Uh, when you pay for a drug and you're paying a percentage cost share, so either either paying a deductible where you pay a whole 100% or you pay a coinsurance where you pay like 20%, you're paying based on the list price. That's the high price before a rebate is received. That's like the sticker price on a car. Exactly. So it's, it's very high. It's not what your health insurance plan is ultimately paying. They later, after you buy the drug, get a rebate after the sale. Now, the plans say they use that to lower your premiums or keep your premiums from growing. There's been a lot of interest recently by the administration to share the rebates with patients at the point of sale. So when you're picking up your drug, you get that rebate to make your price lower. So if you're paying 20%, you're paying it of a lower price. The fundamental problem I have with rebates and passing them along at the point of sale is that we don't get rebates on everything, or large rebates on everything. We get rebates when there's a lot of competition. So for hepatitis C products, we get very large rebates. For cancer drugs, we don't. We get small rebates. So if you decide you're going to try to solve the cost problem for patients, you're not really solving it kind of equally across people with different disease uh, areas and treatments. Uh, how about this uh, gentleman in the orange shirt? I have a question about how much of the experimentation, development, and production, initial, not production, but development of drugs is done by, by the support of the federal government, hence the money we pay to the federal government to develop drugs that goes to the pharmaceutical companies that we pay outrageous amounts for? A very small fraction. 15% maybe. Yeah, I'll take the under on 15%. Yeah, yeah. 15% net, of, of, net. of total R&D spending. Now yeah, it's, it's true that, yeah. that every drug that's been approved recently started from NIH basic science. But that basic science piece of it is, in a, way, in a way, prelude to, if you will, the hard part of making it a drug. And that's why it takes so much. Yeah, it's, the, it's, it's really, like, the, the step from basic science to drug is so much further than I think people actually understand. Right? And if nothing else, just go look at, like, the number of phase three failures that we have. There's a website that just tracks phase three failures. So this is a drug that's gone basic science, preclinical, Phase one, which is animals. Phase two, which is the first time you're thinking about efficacy. And now you're actually going to test in a big patient population and spend a couple hundred million dollars on a trial. And then you fail. Right? That, that's the, the pipeline we're talking about from basic science. And so it's the, the government, right? basic science, you have to have to figure this out. Um, but it's, not, it's nowhere near the pill you actually ultimately take. When a drug is approved in Europe, India, numbers of other countries on other continents, that drug was 
created here, it was no. sent, no, just. It's no, but yeah. It doesn't happen? It happens, yeah, fine. <laughs> Go ahead. Let, let him finish, yeah. let him finish. Go ahead. It was approved in other countries. Okay, let's say it wasn't created here. A drug was approved in other countries, then went through clinical trials. It had been in place for 15 years, and then it comes here and it's got to go through a three to five year period of testing again. That's a question. I mean, that, so to be clear, like why we're shaking my head, that rarely happens. What happens is that the drug comes here first. Why does it come here first? The minute you patent that compound, the patent clock is ticking. So every day that goes by, that drug is worth less money to you. What do you do to optimally deploy capital then? You deploy it in the United States first because the return is highest. And so if you look, like with, at one, one measure of the lack of access for European countries, and I think Europeans get generally good access, is delay from approval in the US to when they get it. And the places that you get less money, they get the drugs later. The only reason I shook my head on the not made here is I just want to be clear, drug development happens all over the world. There are, like, there, the United States is not some unique, innovative, science-producing country. It happens every, we have great pharmaceutical companies in Europe, we have great pharmaceutical companies in Israel, we have an emerging Chinese biotech uh, sector now. India. They're making great drugs and they're all aiming to sell them here. But I just want to be clear, sometimes we talk about the US subsidizes innovation and I just want to make sure no one leaves here with the idea that what we're saying is that American scientists are somehow uniquely innovative, right? It's that the profits in the US subsidize innovation around the world. Um, There's a woman here on the white blazer. Hi, uh, Anna Hyde with the Arthritis Foundation. Thank you so much for this panel. This has been really interesting. Um, a lot of us for years have talked about the promise of biosimilars in helping to address drug costs. Now we have some on the market and the market share is not good, at least for my therapeutic area. Um, and the signals in the market are very confusing. So we have evidence of some insurance plans that are preferring a biosimilar and then we have evidence of others who are preferring the branded drug it's really hard to figure out what the trend line is and what's gonna happen in the next five, 10 years. I would love your perspective, each of you on the biosimilars market, where we're going. And really my question is, is the promise of biosimilars a fallacy? So I just wanna take a second and explain what a biosimilar is. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, sorry if everyone already knows this. Um, so there are classes of drugs called biologics that are a little bit different than like a pill you take. They're made from cells and biologic processes and it's harder to make copies of those. You can't make an exact copy like you could from a pill that's just like a chemical. And so uh, as part of the ACA, they created this program where uh, other companies could make something that was similar, that had a similar effect, but they were maybe making it using a slightly different process. And the idea was that those could compete with the original drugs like generic drugs compete for small molecule drugs. So that's what the question is about. So I think biosimilars um, are gonna be tough and we've known from day one that they were gonna be tough or not the same as a, a generic drug that we typically think of because they are more expensive to develop. And uh, there's also a bit of a learning curve or an education campaign that kind of works against biosimilars in some ways where you know, they aren't exact copies. So the question is, you know, are they worse than is, is sort of the way it gets asked, but you know, actually sometimes they could be better than. Uh, you're exactly right with um, whether or not they're getting coverage placement on formularies versus branded drugs, the reference product. Um, some of the work I've done has shown that uh, they're not really getting picked up as much, and part of that we think is because of rebates. So biosimilars won't pay a discount the same way that a branded drug manufacturer would. Um, I guess the last thing is all of this is related to competition. We see the same thing happening for generic drugs that are small molecule drugs or the pills that you think about taking when they're used for more rare conditions where we don't see as many manufacturers coming on the market, which helps to drive prices down. So it's a, it's a hard area for sure. But I would point out that we shouldn't consider it a failure right. if the rebate got bigger for the biologic yeah. after the biosimilar came to exist. That's kind of what we want. Mm -hmm. So well, that's yeah. a good thing. I think one thing we have to keep in mind is that we're four years into the implementation yeah, of the biosimilar it's pathway. Early. It's early. Um, we regulate, created a generic market in the United States in 84 with the Hatch-Waxman Act. 1988, it wasn't like we had this well-functioning generic market and everyone knew how it was gonna go. I think where we need to get to is we created different rules for biosimilars to come to market in terms of its approval. I think we might need to start to look at different rules for rebates as well. 
that just the nature of competition um, when patients won't stop taking the drug is different. So with a, with a generic, you go to the pharmacy, it just automatically substitutes to the cheapest drug. With a biologic, that's not true, and there might be science-based reasons we want that or not, and we can debate that. But without that, without being able to move patients, the rebate can create a lot of stickiness, and you can, as a as a big company, sort of block any entrant using the rebate. So we might have to develop different rules for that. But it's a process. We needed that for you know for Hatch Waxman as well. Chris. Um, hi, I'm Chris Jennings of. Jennings Policy Strategy is very creatively named. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you've talked a lot about competition, but I want to ask this question about the future of pharmacological interventions. It, it, it appears like we're going to see fewer and fewer products with lots of competition, which suggests that we will face higher and higher prices, and particularly in those areas which are called single source drugs, they don't have competition. We have set up a system whereby actually the pharmaceutical industry has to respond to the investors to say, give me your highest price because guess what? Government will pay you whatever you charge, right? That's, that is our current system. How do you address that going forward? It, it, you can't just have a blank check on behalf of taxpayers for any price. And, and, and in fairness to the manufacturers, they're responding to the investors. They can't even you know, look at them and say, oh, I'm gonna lower the price and therefore get less revenue for you, right? So this just doesn't seem to be like a sustainable approach, particularly if the future of pharmacological interventions are gonna have fewer and fewer competitors. So I'm wondering how we address that. Yeah, I've, I've done a lot of work on this, I guess. So I get, like, you're talking basically about the world of, of, of uh, drugs is becoming, is gonna start looking like what economists refer to as a natural monopoly. But what we mean by a natural monopoly is, so a monopoly is only one seller, a natural monopoly is a market that can't support more than one seller, right? The, the patient population isn't big enough to generate the return or profit necessary to support two people. So, so this is like an example, say, of a cancer drug that only, it works really well, but only for people who have a specific genetic mutation in their cancer. So there might be a very small sliver of people who get really good response to this drug, but it's a small enough population yep. that maybe two people don't want to play in there. Exactly. Um, and it's not, this is not a healthcare topic, right? So no, we have natural monopolies all over the world. The people who string the, the wires to your house for electricity are a natural monopoly. Economists' general belief when we have a natural monopoly is that we want to regulate them. Right? That's, that's, so in the world where you have generic drugs that are natural monopolies, right, we need to think about some type of regulation there in that sense. Because we've already paid for the innovation. And some of the most egregious news stories about drugs have really been about people taking advantage of the natural monopoly status of older medications. So this is, you know, it's a pharma thing we have to talk about, it. Martin Shkreli for Daraprim, but it's also Marathon, it's Horizon, it's Valiant. There are a number of companies that have noticed a financial strategy where small patient populations give immense pricing power, right? For a generic, I, I, it's not like, I don't love high drug prices. I said like I think I want innovation. I don't want high drug prices. So once it's generic, I want the price to go down to that marginal cost of production I talked about. If the market can't deliver that because we can't get two firms, there's a role for government. So I propose that the FDA holds, you know, creates a new form, of, and they have to do it through Congress, right? And with some people from Congress in the back that can take care of this. Um, right? They have to go through the, but they create some new form of generic exclusivity that firms bid for, but they bid for the right to be the sole generic supplier and with a price cost margin. And just have a reverse price, the, the, the low margin is going to clear the market. And we'll give it to you for 10 years, and then we'll rebid it out after that. And what about, I think Chris is asking about new drugs. Was it, was it, was it, like, the reason why, why, Chris is asking about that, but I don't think Chris is, cares so much that they get a high price when they are branded. It's that they're going to get a high price forever, right? Like, and let's be clear that if we do not fix this problem, given the pharmacological things that Chris is talking about, that's the end of the drug pricing system in the U.S. because it only works with generics coming. In a world of precision medicine, every single drug becomes a Daraprim. And now if we fight this fight on a policy level, we're fighting generic producers who are taking advantage of a market failure. In 15 years, you'll be fighting Pfizer, you'll be fighting Merck, you'll be fighting AstraZeneca. And I would imagine that the policymaking process is gonna be a little bit different then than it would be today. Which is why we have to come to a limit on what we're willing to pay. And what I find most amazing is that we do this in almost every other avenue of life. The Department of Transportation figures out a value of statistical life and they figure out what a regulation will impose. 
you know, Department of Labor on safety, EPA used to when they were allowed to, they did this stuff. So I'll just say, look, we do this everywhere except here, all right? And we're in a place where we can't afford what we're doing, so we've got to do it. We've got to bite the bullet. And you know, economists will deliver the bad news. Your choices are between X and Y. You get to pick X and Y eventually. But we've got to do this, Chris, or we have no hope. I think we have time for one more question. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, all right, Who, who's like got the most burning desire? Who has the best question? Raise your hand. <laughs> Raise it the <laughs> highest. If you all could just assemble in the center and fight for the question. <laughs> uh, this gentleman here in the red Fight over the microphone. That's great. <laughs> he looks the most enthusiastic. Oh, great. <laughs> Maybe just coming back to the realm where there is competition. I'm, I'm wondering whether we are contradicting ourselves when we say we welcome competition, but we're against taking patents away. Aren't patents inherently anti-competitive? And... Why in the first place are we treating essential life-saving medicines the way we're treating toasters and microchips and other commodities that patents are traditionally used for? Um, don't we agree that medicines are a public good and not a commodity in the first place? And that the taxpayer who funds the basic science that produces the compound that the company patents shouldn't have to pay again at the pharmacy? So I'm fond of telling the story, that, which is true, that when penicillin was created, the two British kind of scatterbrained scientists who figured it out um, thought it was immoral to profit from something that would save lives as much as penicillin did, and so they never patented it. I will observe that you could grow penicillin <laughs> in your lab, and that's what they did kind of simply. So in the modern world where we're trying to solve these very complex cancers, okay, there's no way that you can depend on, upon that quaint little system. So we've got to have incentives to invest. The reason patents, at least for me, I'll speak for myself, are sort of a touchstone is because that length of time has been fixed for quite some time. And if you start playing around with that, then you create enough uncertainty that you might mess up a lot of investment across all sectors. I do think, however, and I've written this, that thinking about exclusivity link is a different thing. Exclusivity is not patent. It's not fixed and tied to all other industries. Exclusivity is about how long you can keep the data secret once the thing is, is right. So fundamentally, it's about extending the monopoly. You need exclusivity, specifically in biologics, because the effective patent life is so short, once they come to market, they're not going to have enough time to make it up unless they have some exclusivity. The question is, my friend, how long? Mm -hmm. So I would say drugs are not a public good, first of all. Let's be clear, they're rival and excludable. Science is a public good. And that's an important distinction, because what I mean by that is that science is not rival and excludable. And when I, oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. Rival <laughs> means that you, you know, two people can't, or can't use it at the same time. Uh, but the, the, the main point is that science, once people know it, it's very easy to apply. And so we need to protect it. Because in situations where you have a public good, you get an underinvestment. Because if I make a bunch of money and I put it in there, and then all of you get to benefit, and then the price goes down, I get screwed. I lose all my money. So we have to protect that public good. I would note this idea about access to life-saving medications. And this is an interesting point that I want to just end on to think about, about what we mean when we say access. Um, people who don't have access to a drug today that exists is an identifiable, salient photo opportunity that we can point to and say, this person doesn't have that drug. People who don't have access to drugs in the future, though, because they don't exist today, they don't have that option, right? They're not, you, I can't identify them, we don't talk about them, but they don't have the luxury of negotiating the price of their drug, right? They can't get access. About a year ago, we lost my mother-in-law to cancer. We would have paid any amount of money that we've had. And listen, my family's broadly been fortunate, we have money to do this, but there was no amount of money that we could have paid to get her access to a drug that would have cured her cancer. Right? And so that's the access question I think gets underplayed in the drug conversation, right? Is this idea about the access to drugs in the future. Those people don't get a seat at the table. They don't get a seat at the political table in particular. And that's why I get worried about when we start introducing politics into this decision about how we value things today and tomorrow. But politics is there because we're paying for it. So we have to figure this out. That, that, that's fine. Markets are here too. It's good. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you guys so much. We're run out of time. Um.